Okay, my name is Donna Messer-Smith, and I'm at NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute, within the Education Community Involvement Branch. And welcome everyone to our presentations of our 2021 to 2023 ISCC PEGS Scholar Group. Uh, we're really proud to have this, this project going, especially in the sense that this gives an opportunity for people early in their careers to connect through uh, the ISCC PEG with people more senior in their genomics related careers through education or clinicians or uh, educators themselves creating resources and connecting with other clinicians. So um, this is our second class. And um, today we have presentations from Abimbola Oladeo and Sarah Roth. And we're happy to say that uh, the mentor for Abimbola is present. And um, we're going to have a introduction, I believe, from, um, because I saw you on the, on the call, Dr. Brody. Is that correct, Dr. Brody? I was going to introduce Sarah. Sarah, right. Yeah. So Sarah, Sarah will have an introduction from Dr. Brody. And I think we can jump in and begin with the introduction from Dr. L Wilkins Hogg of Avimbola, and then I'll you share this. Yours, you can share. Let's see. You need to um, be able to share the screen. Of, all right. So great. So I can go ahead and introduce Avimbola. Um, as you as you see here, she's currently at the University of Iowa. Her training is in dentistry and her particular interests are in the genetics of orofacial um, uh, complications and orofacial developmental uh, changes. I think that, you know, we she reached out as a mentee and we were looking at um, her interest in wanting to educate providers but also uh, my interest within educating providers with an OBGYN. So we were trying to marry the two of those um, to um, develop a project. So I will let her take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Louise. And um, I'll just ask, can everybody see my screen without a comment? Perfect. Uh, so good day, everyone. I am Abim Bonola that has introduced, and I'm a member of the 2021 to 2023 class of scholars, and I'm also a T90 fellow at the College of Dentistry, University of Iowa. I had the opportunity to be mentored by Dr. Louise Wu, just introduced me in the OBGYN work group, and I would like to thank all for giving me the opportunity to share my presentation today. So um, to give a brief overview of um, our project, our project goal was to improve access to genetics and genomics education resources by creating a central resource point consisting of up-to-date information. And this is because a lot of efforts have gone into, and it's still going into cur curating resources and tools to foster genomics literacy of providers. However, a lot more could be done to ensure that the audience benefits from these resources optimally. And as a virtue of my involvement in the OBGYN work group, our target audience would be OBGYN providers. And we know that the advances in our understanding of the molecular basis of inherited disorders have led to the increased adoption of genomic technologies at different point of care. And this would include diagnostics, prognostics, treatment, and preventive intervention. And as the advances in the science of genomics continue, it is essential for providers to have access to evidence-based information to guide their management options for their patients. And genetics and genomics testing are increasingly becoming a more integral part 
of routine medical practice, including OBGYN practice. And as such, um, a thorough knowledge or lack of these advances may impact uh, um, treatment and prevention approach to fetal and maternal care. And this further speaks to the need to improve OBGYN providers' understanding of basic principles of genetic screening and interpretation. Although the importance of genomic literacy in healthcare providers have been emphasized, low level of literacy, genomics literacy in non-genetic healthcare providers, including OBGYN professionals still persists. And um, clinicians should understand the basic genomics principle and how they apply to their chosen specialty because having this basic understanding allows an appropriate response to queries that can exist, that can arise from either patients or their families. And also um, the knowledge to seek for the expertise or help if required. And research has shown OBGYN professionals um, limited genomic literacy to manifest in different ways. And these include limited knowledge regarding testing options, low confidence about using genetic tests results in patient care, limited knowledge about when and how to make um, a referral to a specialist or not knowing um, how to conduct risk assessment using variant information in care decisions. And again, because of the shortage of genetic counselors, OBGYN providers would be called upon to uh, be more involved in genetic testing and its outcomes. All of this would impact the delivery and incorporation of genomics into care. So what are the barriers um, to provider genomic education that has been identified? This includes time requirements for elective education, having commercial or for-profit entities being major sources of information, um, the pace of advancement of genomic technologies not matching the pace at which the available resources are being updated and um, providers awareness of educational resources that currently exist and how easy it is to navigate these resources. And for example, we would see that on the ACOG's website, even after having these educational resources, you have disclaimers that these resources are for informational purposes only, or they reflect emerging clinical and scientific advances as of the date issues, and they are subject to change. This can be very frustrating for providers that are already very busy and would need a short point of information to assess or help their patient quickly, adding to the workload that they already have to deal with. And again, for the ACOG or members of specialty, society, special, specialty societies, they may be able to um, assess this information by going to their um, organization. But what about care providers that do not, are not part of or do not have a relationship with a specialist society? So building awareness about the availability of educational resources would be somewhat difficult for them. And as such, education needs to be maintained consistently for these clinicians to be able to keep pace with rapid advances in genetics and genomic technology and its application. So it's imperative for health systems to develop scalable strategies to engage, educate, and empower non-genetic healthcare providers in large numbers to be able to use genetic information. And thus, they need to curate resources providing up-to-date information on basic genetic concepts of um, and diagnostic techniques for OBGYN providers and by extension other providers becomes very important. And um, another abstract by the ACOG that was released earlier in the year looked at um, a survey of prenatal care providers, including OBGYN providers, and they looked at professionals' knowledge, barriers, and confidence in prenatal genetic counseling. And they found that providers spent too little time on genetic counseling. More than half of the participants could not correctly identify ACOG's recommendations. And they listed barriers such as time constraints, health literacy, lack of a visual aid, and language barriers as things that um, affected their knowledge and confidence. And the future direction from this abstract uh, pointed to the need to develop and assess 
prenatal genetics education tools to supplement counseling. So um, what we did was uh, to conduct a review of available information through Google Scholar, PubMed, and websites of scientific, clinical, and professional organizations to see what resources were existing. And from professional organization, the top obviously was the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We also had information from the American Medical Association, the ACMG, and the European Society of Human Genetics. And um, looking at public databases, we had a list of um, these databases that provided information on um, or ranging from the clinical relevance of genes and variants point of care resources for clinicians and an archive of information about genomic variations and phenotypes and the impact of variation on drug response. We also looked at um, a list of government supported programs that either way um, had gotten a grant for, from the government to develop these resources. And on the top of the list was NHGRI with um, healthcare provider resources for genomics education. And um, this might be a little, um, tiny to read, I'll just read it out. And we have the Genomics Education Resource Center, that's Genome Ed, Global Genetics and Genomics Community, TRIG, Healthcare Provider and Genomics Education, also on genome.gov and the OBG projects. And we also have information for providers and um, also patients from the CDC, State Health Department, and the um, National Coordinating Center for the Regional Genetics Network. So for educational portals, we had information from nonprofits, MOOCs, and also the Genomes Ed uh, program, which is um, not in the United States, but I'm um, out of the country. Um, and earlier in the year, um, one of the educational portals that existed, um, by the time I had a meeting with Donna some weeks ago, it no longer exists. And um, this is what you would see when you go to that website, which again points to the very fluid nature of the availability of resources and how this can uh, make it difficult for providers who clearly don't know where to go to, to find um, information. So um, going through all of this, is there any evidence that web-based um, genome education approaches are effective? Well, this study um, described the content and impact of a mandatory system-wide program that was implemented at Salford Health. Um, it's called the Image Genetics Initiative, and um, they developed a two-year genetics education program with quarterly web-based modules, and this was made mandatory for physicians and um, advanced practice providers. And they reported that web-based gen uh, genome ed uh, programs or this program was highly effective in increasing healthcare providers' confidence about using genetics. So uh, based on what we found, I, um, the first thing that we would recommend is that for the existing resources, it would be helpful for providers to find if they were organized based on keywords or common categories. And um, going through Genome Ed quickly, you can type OBGYN or GYN resources and see um, what uh, the output of the sketch would be. Um, the second recommendation was also to find a way to improve providers' awareness about education resources and a clear plan for dissemination. For example, um, the way that G2C2 became non-existent and um, the website is also something unrelated to um, genomics education. And also a review of the available education resources, which is thankfully ongoing um, from my discussions with Donna. And um, again, extending that to um, the understanding and supporting of patients following testing. So how do we um, educate our providers to make better reference to genetic counselors? And also familiarity with uh, practical and ethical issues. For example, patient identity protection, not withholding information from patients regarding their health, including test results and managing secondary findings, which could raise complex or ethical and legal issues. And also uh, propose an alliance consisting of multiple organizations to develop a standard and central education approach. And ISCCP 
PEG could uh, be able to take a lead on this or reach out to organizations that would be able to uh, take the lead on this. I would like to um, acknowledge my mentor um, for taking her time um, in the past two years to offer uh, expertise and guidance and also um, the OBGYN um, genetics curriculum co-chair Barbara, the ISSC PEG co-chairs um, Rich and Donna, I'm very grateful for your support, um, the NAGRI for putting this program together and my mentor at the University of Iowa and NIH for uh, providing um, the, my training grant. These are my references and um, thank you for listening and I'll take questions now. Thank you, Abit Bola. And uh, I've also had the pleasure of working with Abit Bola, particularly on that last point about how web resources are rather fluid. Thanks, Donna. We're happy to entertain other questions. So I have a question. And, and do you think there is a, a role for trying to centralize them? I can for give me, my... For me or for Donna? It's for Abimbola. Abimbola, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, obviously, because um, having to go to several points to look for resources can be exhausting. So if we have a central point where, you know, reducing that search time and also we are able to, you know, point to a resource that it is standardized, it is coming from um, an organization that obviously not uh, for profit and all of mm -hmm. that. So you're having some form of confidence that the resources that you're getting is of good quality. So I think, yes, there's a role for um, that centralization. Great. Donna? Um, one question that we uh, consider is NHGRI at the central place to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, I'm staff here, so I'm biased. But um, what are your thoughts on on that? Obviously, I would say that yes, that's that would be the um, logical way to you know go about that but how do we ensure that providers know that um NHGRI is ready to be the one-stop shop for all of their genome ed needs happy to hear other people's thoughts including yours Louise yeah and I think several people beat to it in the chat already saying that an HGRI would be a good place um because I think Many of the other sites are challenged with um, how fluid they are with support and such, um, so that they disappear. And then, you know, as Amabola said, physicians become very frustrated and patients become very frustrated, and they often then go to more commercial sites. But I think the other key aspect to this is that under um, an umbrella like NHGRI, there's also a commitment to keeping these items updated which I think is very important um, as the whole area changes very rapidly, there has to be like a yearly review, you know, a process of commitment to continue to update. Uh, I believe we have folks on the call who are in project groups within ISCCPEG who've been very dedicated to keeping resources updated. It's a challenge as we all know. So it's something that we have to keep at. Yeah, and someone just suggested in a partnership with ACOG, which I think is a great, um, a great idea as well. Yeah, and the ISCC PEG, of course, is uh, began as a core component of ISCC PEG was the professional societies. Yeah, those partnerships are key. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I would love to see that move forward. I think Lawrence Brody has his hand up. Yes, you mentioned commercial parts, and this maybe is for the clinicians in the audience as to what is the threshold to have this tip over so now up to date or some of the other commercial providers actually take it on? I, I believe that they do a reasonably good job at keeping the material up to date. I know they employ a bunch of professional. Uh, experts to, to make sure it's accurate. Um, 
not that I'm trying to shirk <laughs> genome's responsibility here, but um, they reach a large audience um, and it's yeah. really a viable business model. And so is there, a, does anyone know what the threshold is on when they actually would say, oh, we're going to create modules on this? So I'll, I can comment and then also with a disclosure that I'm one of the editors for up to date. Um, and I think that they are commercial, but the difference is that they're not driven by the sale of a product that, except for the knowledge that they're putting forward, they're not producing the test that you're ordering. But I think that that's also another good idea because a lot of, a lot of clinicians either independently or now, or now through Epic are tied to um, up-to-date modules. Oh, thank you. I, I see a, a hand from Dr. Tracy Weiler. So just regarding up-to-date in the, um, we've created an FAQ um, that is hosted on genome.gov and our approach was to go talk to, to um, the up-to-date editor um, and say, hey, can you put a link to our stuff on the up-to-date site? Because you're right, it's really, really important to get to where the people are. The people aren't going to come from, a, you know, from their, um, you know, ob office to NHGRI. They're just not. So we've got to get them where they're going to go and, you know, shepherd them to where the information is. I think so that's, that's one point. As a side and, and disclosure, my wife has done now up-to-date stuff and every once in a while she gets a check. So it, it's, it is an opportunity for some of the genetics education people to monetize their knowledge. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Evan Bola, did you want to have any wrap-up comments? Uh, so um, I think Kate Lisa had a question on how G2C2 fits into the idea of a central repository. And um, as um, I said, my last discussion with Donna, G2C2 is no more, and that the content um, are being moved to um, NAGRI. So it looks like NAGRI is consolidating resources from, or external resources, or from um, repositories that used to be. So G2C2 might be no more, but you can also access the resources on um, genome.gov. If I'm correct, Donna? That's correct, right. Genome Ed is where we're centralizing the repository that was G2C2, which served an important role, but um, needed to be updated. Yeah, so this is Kathy Blazer. I'm the one who posted that question. Um, so I did go to it. I see that it is. And so would this be like a place we would build from if we were to try to take Amabola's idea and, and make a more robust central resource and then taking Tracy's idea and then disseminating access to that resource or links to the, that resource for different groups? Um, would that be something that would be the way we look at this? Because we already there already is a repository, right? It's not like it doesn't exist. I just, I agree. It's a staffing and you know question of how we can manage that. Yeah, yeah. So so it's I mean it's not starting from it's not cutting it from whole cloth. There already is this wonderful, robust, and very attractive resource that, as Tracy mentions, is underutilized and perhaps many people don't recognize it and are not going to go out searching for it. But I think you're, to your point, Tracy, the, 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 a lot of the work is drilling down into making people aware of it and making it easy for them to access. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was one of the motivations also that Emma Bull and I spoke about is like, at least to get this out into an article that ob guys read so that they have the links there, you know. But up to date's a good idea as well. Right, the, the partnerships I think are gonna be key in getting this out. All right, I think we're to time. Thank you everyone. And we really appreciate the contributions on the chat and uh, the discussion that we've had. Thank you everyone. So, and I, I have to put a shout out to our mentor in this case, Louise Wilkins-Hogg. 
and certainly to our mentee, um, this might be the time for me to say we're looking for mentors for our new class. And um, it certainly, it was my pleasure. It was it was great fun, and she did a wonderful job. Thank you. All right, I think this is the point in our agenda where I believe uh, Dr. Brody, you can put your camera on and introduce our next scholar, which is okay. Sarah. Rock. The camera is on over here. There we go. And um, so it, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Sarah Roth. I am neither her mentor nor advisor. Um, I would say I'm an acquaintance and someone who's had it off. Uh, <coughs> Nice opportunities to discuss lots of different topics with Sarah over over the years. Um, actually, it's now many years since we first met. Um, she's also, I think, still a neighbor. So she lives a couple hundred yards from where I'm sitting and probably where she's sitting. They're relatively close. So she gives me good restaurant advice as well. Uh, but Sarah is um, takes the approach that is sometimes a difficult road to, to follow in the academic world where you're interested broadly in a lot of different things and you want to bring them all together. Um, it is, a, just for those of you that are trainees, the, that kind of career path it can be greatly rewarding. It's a little bit tougher because it's easier if what you do is study one organelle and people know how to define you. So I have a hard time defining what Sarah does. She's interested in history, interested in the humanities, interested in the sciences, uh, is a genetic counselor, having been through our um, joint genetic counselor program at NHGRI, and is currently a PhD candidate in anthropology at, at Hopkins. Um, as I said, she's interested in the broad use of uh, biomedical stuff from the humanities, the, the personal view, the community view, and um, as well as having seen her and invited her to present at a meeting that I helped run uh, in Montreal, is an excellent um, presenter as well. So her mentors, who I guess are not here, I don't see them, uh, otherwise they would be doing a better job at introducing Sarah than I am, uh, are Audrey Squire, uh, at Seattle Children's Hospital and Daniel McKenna at, at Penn University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And they should take credit for anything nice that um, uh, you hear uh, Sarah present because I cannot take credit for it. And Sarah obviously will take, deserves most of the credit. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Brody. I, I do want to mention Dr. Larry Brody is our division director of genomics and society. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Brody, uh, for that introduction. And I will share my PowerPoint. Are you all able to see just, just the PowerPoint? Yes. OK, great. Um, well, well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah. I've been a ISCC PIG scholar, part of the cohort from the last two years. Um, I think maybe, I think it's possible that someone might need to mute themselves. I hear. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, ISCC PIG scholar cohort from the last couple of years. Um, I recently graduated from the Hopkins NIH genetic counseling program, and I'm currently wrapping up a PhD in medical anthropology at Hopkins. I am a sort of late stage PhD student um, doing that and bringing together these two things as Larry gestured to. So my project as an ISCC pig scholar has been a qualitative study designed to explore the lived experiences of trans and gender diverse folks with hereditary cancer risk. Uh, my mentors, as Dr. Brody mentioned, are Danielle McKenna and Audrey Squire at Penn and Washington, um, but also Layla Jamal and Kellen Baker, who have also been uh, involved with ISCC PEG. Uh, they were both on my committee for the project at Hopkins, so also both quite involved with the project development. Um, and Layla has been my uh, advisor for the project as well. Uh, so before I dive into talking about the project, I just wanted to note that language is important in this field, and here I'll be talking about 
sex as assigned at birth, gender as lived and expressed, and transgender or trans folks as having a gender identity that's different from sex assigned at birth. And here I use gender diverse as an umbrella term that more broadly encompasses folks whose gender identities differ from sex assigned at birth, but that also includes non-binary, gender non-conforming, and gender queer identities. Um, so at the beginning of this project, and I went into greater detail about this in my initial scholars talk, um, but I thought I would I would highlight the background a little bit because then and kind of iteratively as I write up analysis, I've turned to the medical literature to see what it says about trans experiences of cancer risk. Um, and generally speaking, trans folks are, are just sort of vastly underrepresented in medical and epidemiological studies of cancer risk, which then creates these exclusions from data sets as well as standards of care used to care for these populations, as I'm sure many of you are very aware if you're working in the field. Um, this is especially notable in cancer care where risk figures are inscribed with the presumed gender of these big population data sets. Um, and so in my thesis, as well as in my IACC PAIC Scholars project, I held space for this work to address these gaps and needs through interviews. So last year for this project, I interviewed 19 gender diverse folks, the majority of whom had BRCA1 or 2 pathogenic variants were in their 20s or 30s and were non-binary or genderqueer. They were also importantly, mostly white. Um, because this is generally what the participants in patient advocacy groups look like, and that is where I met and recruited folks, this wasn't a terrible surprise, but it definitely points to very necessary future directions um, in working with other underrepresented groups in research. After looking, looking over transcripts and recordings from interviews, as well as reflexive field notes that I took as I was conducting the projects, I really moved between interviews and the literature to articulate three main themes that I'll focus on to highlight. Um, these are also the themes that I outline in the first pub publication on the project that I'm working on, um, which is it's currently under review for the Journal of Genetic Counseling and hopefully will will be forthcoming soon. Um, so firstly, interviewees described experiences of discrimination and dysphoria as they navigated care experiences as well as care environments. They also shared narratives of gender identity and genetic diagnosis intertwining in terms of access to interventions, shifting relationships to gender identity and expression, and navigating multivalent forms of medical uncertainty in their care. Throughout interviews, participants also shared their aspirations for what hereditary cancer care could or should look like for other gender diverse folks navigating it. So as highlighted in my last talk, interviewees really pointed to what anthropologist Lachlan Jane has called the redoubling of femininity in cancer care, marking experiences of dis-ease they had navigating interactions and care environments. Many participants reflected this remark by Ben, oh, sorry, the second quote, a trans BRCA2 carrier, that the worst thing that, um, the worst space to navigate for them was the waiting rooms. They also pointed to screening appointments and interactions with admins and texts as especially difficult, as these were the most common places that they were misgendered. Interviewees explored the social and emotional ways that they responded to these experiences, in particular describing how they would brace for misgendering in advance of appointments. This really supports lit documenting trans experiences of anticipatory anxiety around genetic counseling encounters that Role describes in a recent article in the Journal of Genetic Counseling, and also suggests that cancer genetic counselors and folks working in oncology can anticipate anxiety from their patients. Um, stemming from previous experiences of, mistreat of mistreatment or anticipating future experiences of mistreatment. And this really calls for specialized compassionate care, which I will circle back to after I dive into a couple more sets of quotes. So 
In interviews, participants explored the complex ways that their care journeys intertwined. And this theme from interviews is really at the heart of our article manuscript and is also dear to me as a queer BRCA1 carrier myself because it's, it's really up for folks in the community as they navigate these intertwining fields. Um, as Fern described in their interview, there were uh, care from these experiences were tied up or interlaced together. For many, cancer risk on the one hand presented a crossroads in gender expression, how to respond to the embodied risk, prophylactic recommendations, or disease. For some, also, the risk or genetic diagnosis presented a different kind of turning point, one that enabled them to overcome barriers to gender-affirming care through insurance coverage for surgeries in particular. At the same time, though, an alert to elevated risk and recommended screenings introduced no new forms of medical uncertainty. Um, and hopefully you can read more about this soon in our article manuscript. And in the meantime, if you're interested in reading more about these kind of intertwining journeys, I'd suggest taking a look at the article Cancer Butch by Lachlan Jane in the Cultural Anthropology Journal. And these are two sub themes. Um, that I that I just highlighted and should have clicked clicked through as I was talking. So as they navigated largely unwelcoming environments and these complex care experiences, interviewees also shared about experiences that were affirming or gave them insight on a future that they'd like to see for hereditary cancer care. Jason, a non-binary BRCA2 carrier, reflected on how it felt when a clinician honored the identity that they had shared on an intake form. I feel like my identity is included in the room, they said, rather than just my biology. Reflecting on these experiences and needs and barriers that they encountered navigating care, Participants shared that they appreciated when providers communicated a sense of allyship, so implicitly or explicitly through cues, pins, or lanyards, uh, were attentive to gendered language, partnered around difficult and complex care decisions, and validated and normalized their preferences. They also expressed, importantly, a real longing for providers to work to hold space for the emotional complexity of pre -vibership, um, so living with cancer risk over time and through many different kinds of difficult and complex care junctures. So as I conclude, I thought I'd spend my last couple minutes discussing some ways that providers can use these insights to work more inclusively with patients and communities, since the majority of folks present are likely providers working in these intersecting or allied spaces. And I'll also note that um, the experience of Working on this project has helped me to develop some um, some of these practice implications modules, and, and I've used them to um, help give uh, guest lectures for trainees in the Hopkins NIH program. So that's something that I should note and highlight because it's an education piece. Um, so, okay. So in the context of these complex care journeys for gender diverse folks navigating hereditary cancer care, and also keeping in mind mounting attempts to censor trans existence within the US and around the world through anti-trans legislation, it's really important to consider how we can build trust with queer and trans clients. And here are some ways that we can do it in this space specifically. So in addition to listening well, asking for pronouns and conveying a sense of implicit or explicit allyship. We can also ask for input on a family tree as we document it. So if you're working in person, you can kind of like share the, the document as you're mocking it up, ask them, how does this look? Ask for input about um, how you represent the gender of family members. Um, you can also partner through counseling skills around experiences of dysphoria as they come up as uh, cancer related experiences are narrated. Um, and importantly, you can use gender neutral or patient first language to describe parts of the body as well as care experiences. So we can also, especially in cancer genetic counseling, explore gender identity and expression in the clinic. Um, we can do this, again, by using these counseling skills that we develop through our specialized training to compassionately explore gender as a theme of interest. So asking open-ended questions, 
following the patient's lead on language around labels and exploring what their vision for gender affirmation looks like or could look like. That said, especially in the context of clinical environments and the sort of like transphobic political milieu, especially in, in specific regions of the states, um, people aren't always gonna come into a genetic counseling or oncology session expecting to get vulnerable and they may be primed by difficult passage points before uh, meeting with us. And so it's also okay if someone doesn't feel safe getting vulnerable and exploring this in a clinical setting. Um, finally, as clinicians and as genetic counselors in particular, we can refer clients to support and there's no reason not to, uh, to refer folks to queer friendly support um, settings with affinity group offerings. Um, so we can share information about FORCE's LGBTQ support group, which full disclosure, I'm now a co-leader for, and I'm happy to provide information about. Um, and we can also share information about uh, the Breasties uh, LGBTQ support group. Um, these are both monthly, virtual, and they're accessible from anywhere. Um, these groups are not perfect, but they do provide a kind of support and affinity that is hard to find elsewhere and that folks report feeling really sort of uh, disconnected from when navigating oncology settings. Um, so with that, thank you so much to ICT pig for the holding space to work on this project, to my mentors and committee, uh, to the HBOC advocacy groups, and to our study participants. Um, if any of you would like to get in touch, my contact info is under the bird in the lower right-hand corner of this slide. Um, I'm an open book and happy to talk about this work discuss collaborations, or come to your class or program to talk about queer health or qualitative research. Um, thanks so much. And with that, I will turn to questions. Hey, thank you, Sarah. This was a terrific presentation, and we really appreciate um, your work as well as the dedication of your team. And I, the email was blocked briefly so um i think yeah there we go s-a-r-a-h-r-o-t-h at j-h-u dot e-d-u yes please questions i'll have a nerdy question sarah so um your, your data set is, as we know is probably the largest data set of interviews of folks out there who are in this situation. Do you have any idea of how many, what the total number of people in the US might be that are, I guess we could probably calculate the intersection between trans and ERCA carriers and cancer susceptibility, but have you thought about that? Yeah, that's a good question and not, I'm afraid it's not one that I can answer with the knowledge that I have. Um, I think, you know, the the going number going around the literature, I think, is that like 1.2% of the population is is trans, or or maybe it's 1.4. It's or depending on on what what data set you look at. Um, in terms of how many people are gender diverse and living with hereditary cancer risk. I honestly, I have no idea, but it, whatever it is, it's more than you think. <laughs> I think that's my that was kind of why I was asking, because I bet it is more than I think. Yeah, I, I'm honestly, I feel like even just going about my day-to-day -day life, not in a research setting, I feel like I'm constantly meeting people who are gender diverse and affected by hereditary cancer risk. And yeah, just that's just in in Baltimore. Just you know, <laughs> navigating um, life as a graduate student in Baltimore, and so um, I think it's it's more than is thought, but I don't know how many. So I just did the rough calculation based on your tossed out estimates that if, if you just do breast ovarian cancer, it's probably five thousand people in the U.S., and if you throw in colon cancer susceptibility, then it's double that. Obviously, one has more 
complicated implications than the other. But. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds that sounds that sounds appropriate to me. In terms of yeah, some of those are little kids, so it's not. I mean, they did the whole population in the U.S. So. Right. Oh, and actually, yeah. No, it, it's an estimate. It's not. So Andrew has a question. Yeah, Sarah, thanks for this great uh, presentation and this really interesting qualitative work. Uh, I'm interested to hear you, you meant, talked about gender dysphoria. I'm wondering if you heard, had any emergent themes from these interviews that identified maybe a gender affirming philosophy or behaviors or attitudes of clinicians uh, created a sense of gender euphoria in any of your um, interviews? Yeah, that's that's a really lovely question. Um, so, so like the the easy answer is is yes. In interviews, there are discussions both of dysphoria and euphoria emergent from care experiences. Generally speaking. I think clinical environments, especially for, for people with diagnoses, navigating surveillance and, and just really complicated, tough decisions, um, they're just, they're stressful encounters. They're, there's just a baseline stress to them. And so I think it's a lot easier for a care experience to trigger dysphoria than to bring up gender euphoria, even in the most affirming and supportive of interactions. Um, and so mostly when people were talking about clinical interactions specifically, mostly, um, you know, I would say the spectrum range from like a lot of dysphoria to like a feeling of support and maybe affirmation that felt, you know, like someone was helping to shepherd them through a really tough decision or through a complex, um, complex decision. Um, but people did did talk about gender euphoria as emergent from their experiences of navigating intersecting care journeys. Um, and that mostly came from experiences of community support and like queer community connection um, through, especially for, and this, this is a big theme and it, it comes out in the manuscript a lot. A lot of folks um, feel, felt very affirmed by the experience of having the preventative mastectomy. And um, even if they hadn't um, been thinking they would have top surgery prior to the genetic diagnosis, some people found that through the experience of having a preventative mastectomy, they felt very affirmed and very comfortable and euphoric in their new body, um, though it still carried the trace of the trauma of the genetic diagnosis and all of the, you know, familial and, um, you know, ontological orbits of, uh, of illness and risk. Um, but there, there were lots of discussions of a feeling of coming into oneself and one's gender expression in a way that felt really, really good. It was very, it was just rarely like a key, a key interaction with a provider that got someone there. It was more like just the long-term journey of coming into a body and expression that felt good and feeling a sense of legibility and support and affirmation in that new bodily expression, um, which like the medical piece helped you know, it was a, was a piece of the journey that got there, but yeah, sadly there were, there were very few clinical interactions cited that like brought up, up gender euphoria, but other stuff did. So that's, Tracy, that's a really, really lovely question. Weiler had a somewhat of a related question. So you restricted your study to the clinical interactions around cancer, but other clinical actions are also particularly complex for trans folks, which I guess is a lot, but yeah, yeah, that, that's that's a good question. And and in in interviews and and observation, I talked with folks and observed conversations beyond just cancer. I just I just talked about cancer here, and and in the manuscript, I'm generally focused on cancer. But people talked about there were a couple of people who had who had. Um, had carried pregnancies and had given birth. And so they reflected on their experiences of navigating prenatal care um, as, as gender diverse. Um, and people also talked about navigating 
broader social milieus and, and not just their clinical cancer care environments. Um, something that I have been reflecting on, um, even if I am like connecting cancer care to other clinical interactions, um, is that, and I, I think I'm, I just mentioned this, but people, um, People talked a lot about waiting rooms and imaging appointments as particularly stressful and um, and triggering of of dysphoria and also like sites of misgendering. Um, and I know in the clinical literature on prenatal and repro care, there's a lot of of that present as well. In particular, there was a a twenty one a 2021 study from Ruderman um, that cited waiting rooms and imaging appointments as particularly stressful and gendered, like overtly gendered spaces. Um, and so I feel like there is a, a, a sense of, of resonance between um, cancer care and prenatal care in the in those specific, in the context of those specific sites being stressful or triggering. Um, yeah, so something that emerged from people's discussions of cancer care, but is also applicable to other sites is that a lot of people cited um, being misgendered in their clinical notes. Um, and of course, people have access to their clinical notes after encounters now. And when people see that they've been misgendered in their notes after the fact, even if everything went well in the clinical interaction, there's a sense of like uh, being let down. And um, that is definitely applicable across settings and not just unique to cancer care. It's something that's a, a takeaway for anyone working um, clinically is to have a sense of consistency between, you know, the intake form, the interaction and the notes because people are, people are watching and they're, um, feeling bad when, when they experience um, inconsistency there. Okay, um, I think we're getting up to the time we predicted for our presentations, thank you. And any other questions or comments before Rich provides some concluding remarks? I think I still see Rich. I know his time was. No, I'm here. You're here. Great, great. Yeah, no, so I was just uh, adjusting my camera, which is a little out of whack. But uh, um, oops, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, but yeah, like Kathy just said, um, thank you very much. I mean, the Scholar program was an idea that came out from one of our annual meetings. and has just been uh, incredible. And I hope that both of our scholars got a lot out of the program because we got a lot of working with both of you and learned about a lot from your discussion. So as you go out, uh, you know, hopefully you'll remain associated with us, but if you can also help spread the word about the scholars program, that would also be great. And ISCC PEG, but, and thanks to Donna and the others at NHGRI who have really made you know it's one thing to come up with an idea it's another thing to actually make it happen so very much thanks to them as well but um yeah so we hope we'll see you around so yeah <laughs> thanks a lot yeah thank you uh, to the mentees the mentors and uh you will be getting some certificates you'll see us a little bit more with those communications that like rich says we're certainly uh, not ending our relationships. We're hoping you all will stay with us and continue to contribute. And let me just add, sorry, definitely thank the mentors as well. We know it's a significant time commitment. So, but I hope you found it rewarding as well. But thank you so much for doing that. But yes. all yes. right. Yes. Any other comments or are we wrapped up? I think we're good. Thanks, Donna. I think we're good. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And this is recorded and we will post it on genome.gov eventually. Thank, Thank you. you both so much as well. Good to see y'all.